The law is circular. In our legislature, state, senate, house, senate house, Washington, all of it is there. It's circular. The lawyers primarily are elected to public office, right? They make the laws, right? And you go into a court, is a lawyer who is a judge, right? Is a lawyer who prosecutes and the lawyers who defend, right? They make the law. They defend the law. They prosecute under the law. All of that is a perfect circle. And for one of us to walk in that circle, we better have someone who's already in that circle holding their hands because it's way beyond our understanding. They have a nomenclature and words that the average person like you and me, we just don't get. So it's a very, very exclusive circle. It's like you go on a basketball court and the lawyers own the basketball court, they own the basketball, and they ha one of them has to be the umpire, and only lawyers can play in the game. This is our judicial system today, ladies and gentlemen. That's that little circle. That's that little circle. Did you know in the Bible, there's a whole chapter uttered by Jesus in that he deals with lawyers? Oh, yeah. Look at it, if you would, to Matthew chapter number 23. Seven times he says, woe to scribes, wrote a lawyer. A scribe was a lawyer, someone who wrote the law, interpreted the law, and carried out the law through the Pharisees who would follow the law ever so seriously. So seven times in this one chapter, Jesus says, woe. And the word there could have been translated hopeless. It could be translated, look out. Woe unto the lawyers. Evidently, they had some legal problems in the first century as well. And look, I want you to look especially at one verse in verse 23. Jesus says, woe to you lawyers and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weighter provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These are the things you should have done without neglected the others. You blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Now, what's Jesus saying? He is saying simply that all you lawyers are so careful that if I'm growing some mint, I take 10% of the mint and I give it to the temple. If I have some dill, I take, oh, measure out carefully, 10% of the dill and I give it to the temple. And if I have some cumin, I take 10% of the cumin and I give it to the temple. At the same time, you are totally missing the weightier part of the law, which is justice and mercy and faithfulness. And that's happening in our day. Jesus further illustrates this with a piercing example in Mark chapter number seven. He's still dealing with lawyers, ladies and gentlemen. He's talking about the scribes. Look at Mark 7, verse number 8. Jesus is speaking. Neglecting the commandments of God, you hold to the tradition of men. Jesus was also saying to them, you are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and he who speaks evil of father or mother is put to death. But you say, verse 11, if a man says to his father or his mother, whatever I have that would help you is Corbin. That is to say, I've dedicated all I have to the temple. Therefore, I can't help you, mom. I can't help you, dad. It's Corbin. Jesus says, you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or his mother thus invalidating the word of God by your tradition 
which you have handed down, and you do many things such as that. Now, get this in context. Jesus saying, here is one of the commandments, one of the big ones, right? Honor thy father and thy mother. And he says, you're getting around honoring your parents by saying some little law. Remember the Talmud, the Mishnah was where the, the scribes would take and elaborate and interpret the law with case law and different illustrations. And they had this little law that you could say, all of my possessions are Corbin. The word Corbin means gift. And I've given it to God. Now, he still had it in his portfolio. <laughs> he still could draw from it. But it was a little minutia there, way out on the edge of the law that kept him from being obedient to honoring and helping his parents. It was costly to help those parents. They were sick. They had problems. They were hungry. They, they had no place to go. But he couldn't help them, though he had great resources, because he had dedicated all of his stuff to God, which rarely happened in that day. He still had it, but he got around being obedient to the law. This happens all the time in courts of law today. This will blow you away. Here's someone who's holding up a store. Bang. He kills the person. Witnesses see the murder. He is taken to trial, and somebody didn't read his Miranda writes, therefore, a murderer goes scot-free. Some little minutia of the law out here kept justice from being done. Some little court procedure, someone gets off with a major crime. And see, we are guilty in our courts of law today of taking little bitty peripheral things and let them become the standard when we miss the great principles of justice and mercy and faithfulness. And therefore, we look around and discover in the recent survey that only 16% of Americans believe that the legal system is just and that lawyers are honest. 16%. Let me tell you something. If I were in that profession... And by the way, I would have been in that profession in all probability had not God called me to what I'm doing. I love the law. I respect the law. I honor the law. I believe in a law-abiding society. It's very important as to who we are. But by the same token, we, those in that profession, need to look carefully at what is going on. Is there really justice, mercy, and faithfulness taking place? Do we have equal justice under the law? Let me tell you what's happened. There is great fear when you talk about the judicial system. And first of all, there is the poor. The poor feel they have a fear that's based on a judicial system that they cannot access. I call it judicial access. The poor does not have access to this closed circle. Oh, yeah, the disenfranchised the little person, the one who's left out. How in the world are they going to access this system? How are they going to get in? Oh, you say we have pro bono lawyers. Sure, we have that. We have help. Sure, but not near enough. There are thousands of people who are inundated by all the problems that they have. And the poor and those who are left out, they can't get in. Equal justice under law, not for the bottom realm of society. No way in our America. It sounds good, but in actual practice, it's unrealistic. Oh, now, its exception is if you're in an accident, oh, 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 oh. if there's a tragedy, there'll be lawyers lined up wanting to help the little guy. But normal stuff like wills and and, and like insurance problems and Medicare and Medicaid, and you need some counsel, incomes, you've been mistreated, you've been abused, you've been improperly, things been, I mean, you try to go get a lawyer there on the bottom rung, and I'll tell you, you can't find one. That's not the kind of law they practice. That's not what they do. That's not my area. You have to go somewhere else. And in this circle... Well, the lawyers make the law, interpret the law, 
preside over the law, defend the law, prosecute in the law. They have complete control of every this little sacred holy circle. If anybody dare went in there, illustration, Lake Charles, Louisiana, a man was a CPA. He started helping friends who had problems with their will, and he charged them, you know, $25. Then he had someone else who wanted to declare bankruptcy. And she went to a law firm. They said, well, we can do this for $500. She said, look, if I had $500, I'd pay my bill and I'd have to declare bankruptcy. So this man helped her for $90. And then he went into a rest home. He'd been to help some of the people there, didn't understand Medicare and Medicaid and a lot of the medical things, simply interpreting language, filling out forms. That's beyond so many of us. And guess what happened? In Louisiana, as in almost every state, they have uncertified practice of law, UPL. Oh my goodness, you're practicing law without a license. And this person in Louisiana, seven deputies came to his home where he had his office and they picked him up and handcuffed him, put him in the squad car. They led him down to the station, fingerprinted him, put him in a jail cell and charged him with practicing law without a license, which carries with it a maximum sentence in Louisiana of two years plus a large fine. The problem with him, he was practicing law too cheap for the little person. And this is what we have. By the way, his sentence was suspended. They find, it, they find him a large amount of money they compensated his computer. At last report, he was having trouble finding something to do to make a living for himself. Access is a problem for the poor. Equal justice under law is a problem for the poor. Right here in America, I've been there. Some of you are there. Some of you have been there. I understand that firsthand experience. Judicial access, that's the fear. Among the rich, the business people, the corporate world, those who have, it's judicial excess. In other words, we're, we're so afraid that something little and trivial will turn into something gigantic. What about the person who spilled uh, McDonald's coffee in their lap? Oh, wasn't that a beautiful lawsuit? Man, if that works, I'm gonna spill coffee about once every two years. What about the guy in Washington, D.C., who's connected with the courts in some way? He got mad at the Korean couple where he was getting his pants dry cleaned, and they lost a pair of $57, $57 pants, and he sued them for $52 million, and it got in a court of law. And I read the particulars as how he got to that number. It is unbelievable. What about in the school system in North Carolina where a little first grade boy reached over and kissed a little first grade girl and the girl's parents got upset and they had to suspend the boy for a period of time from school. How silly and how tragic and how ridiculous we can get in our culture. And, and, and we have those in places of, of, of authority. We're afraid at the excess of the judicial system. Like in Minneapolis, had a situation there where a man who was a member of a Catholic church, a layman in the church, not a priest in the church, he was carrying something for a shut-in, trying to be in a minister to a laity organization. In the process, he ran a red light. There was an accident. An 82-year-old man became a quadriplegic, and therefore the lawyer took the case. He was looking for deep pockets. And finally he said, oh, the Archdiocese of Minneapolis, deep pockets, and he sued. And I read his last plea before the jury, I'm sure with tears coming down his eyes, legitimately so for the man who's a quadriplegic, but, but tears and tell him all that he couldn't do, that he could be, and therefore the judgment was for $17 million against the church, the Archdiocese of Minneapolis. Excess. You say, well, a lot of this doesn't get tried. That's what the attorneys tell you, and that's true, because of fear. 
Only less than 2% go to a court of law, but our insurance companies, we pay off because we're afraid there will not be justice and we're afraid that there will be excess in relation to the process of what's going on. And by the way, the poor people, they fear they don't have access. The rich fear excess, not in parameters, not in boundaries of the claims that are made. And the rest of us, we just fear the whole process. Well, we, we don't understand the process of all of this. It's beyond us. The language, the involvement, the technicality of when you go and how you show and what works. I mean, it's just beyond us because we're not in that very, very exclusive club. And if you go in that club, unless you've got somebody in the club holding you by hand, you're way, way out of bounds. The whole process of it. Little League baseball game. All-star second baseman, tremendous player. Center fielder didn't show up. The coach tells the all-star second baseman, Joey, go play center field today. Boy, I need you out there. Joey goes out there. Third inning, fly ball goes up. He loses it in the sun. The ball comes out, hits him in the eye. Doesn't put his eye out. His eye is hurt. It's black, it's swollen. His parents sue the little league and sue the coaches because they didn't offer him sunglasses and nobody ever taught him how to catch a ball in the sun. And the coaches finally settle for $25,000 to the family. Have you ever heard of reasonable risk in life? Every time something happens doesn't mean that, boy, I've got to go find some way I can sue somebody. It's the process that gets us. What about in St. Petersburg, Florida? Maybe you saw this on TV a few years back. You got, you got this little four-year-old kindergarten girl, and she's in the room pushing desk over. She's throwing paper on the floor. She goes to the wall and pulls down bulletin boards. She's making havoc of her room. At the same time, the assistant principal is surrounding her like this. You know, teaching somebody to play guard basketball, Little girl here, and the assistant principal is, is around her like this, and she's just wrecking everything. Finally, she, he's, he sort of herds her into the principal's office, and she begins to tear everything up in there off the wall. And finally, the police come. She weighs 40 pounds. She's four years old, and they put her in handcuffs. <laughs> Maybe it's hemophilia. Man, why, why in the world couldn't? You see, you can't touch. Oh, if you touch. Oh, 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 man, there's a whole myriad of laws that come down on you. We live lives of defensiveness because the absurdity many times of our judicial system. So here's the problem. The structure, our judicial system is cracked because of a lack of access for the poor. And it's cracked because of the fear of excess by those who are in business and those who are in the plus of the community. And there's the fear of the whole process by the rest of us. What's the answer? This isn't the total answer. I'm not speaking ex cathedra. And I'm certainly, I'm outside my realm in many, many ways. But I have talked to a dean of a law school I've talked to lawyers of every side of the practice. I've talked to judges, and I have done my homework. And let me, this is not what they're saying. Let me give you some basic answers. First of all, let's enter into the court of the judge. Let's go in the judge's court and talk about the judge. Judges need to set parameters and boundaries. They need to be in charge of the courtroom and they need to have the courage and the common sense to throw a lot of this junk out. Now, let me tell you what happens. In a federal court, you almost never have previous lawsuits, silly little lawsuit. You know why? Now, they have a way to handle it. Federal court, they have rule number 11. It's about this thick. And it says a federal judge 
when they see that something's coming for him that's not factual, that's not evidential, that's not right, that's not logical, that is silly, the federal judge hammers the person and hammers the lawyers, and man, he comes down on them. You don't have silliness very much in federal courts. That, that rule 11 never has to be applied. In state courts, federal courts, by the way, are appointed. Remember, federal judges are appointed. In state courts, the judges are elected. And they, they, they have a rule 13 by, by which they can handle the silliness there. But it is very rarely used. And by the way, the federal rule for handling all this is this thick. The state rule I've got on my desk is about this thick. But the state judges, they do not do this. Why? Because they're elected. And because the lawyer before them may be a member of a firm or part of a practice that gave him a lot of money for his reelection. Oh, I've got to get reelected. And therefore, if he says this is not legitimate, the lawyer presents a case, listen to this carefully. Well, let this be decided by their peers in a court of law, by a jury. That's what the Constitution guarantees. Oh, no. The Constitution guarantees if there is a legitimacy of the law, then it goes into the courtroom where their peers and the judge has to determine that. He has to make that decision. That's his calling. And they're reticent to do it when a lawyer is there. His firm has contributed a lot of money to his reelection. You know, the umpire that you write a check for 5000 for him to be reelected, remember? He said he's going to be objective, even though my son's on the mound pitching. Man, we need to take that umpire and make him a saint and put wings on him. This happens with judges. Therefore, state judges rarely throw all this stuff out. They're afraid. Give me more judges like Judge Janice Jack of Corpus Christi. I don't know her. Read the case. Silicosis. 10,000 people had silicosis. It's coming for her court in Corpus. What is silicosis? You had an incident in 1930, Tennessee Valley Authority, when 600 people died with silicosis. Over. It's when you breathe rock or sand in the fine air, and they hit, hit a whole string of, of silica, and it got in the air, and 600 goes in your lungs, and it's, it's a horrific death. But here are 10,000 cases advertised over television have silicosis. And Judge Jack did a very unusual thing for a judge. She spent a year looking at these cases. What they do, they try three or four of the cases, then they just settle all the rest of them because you could spend a lifetime with 10,000 cases in court. But she looked at the legitimacy of these cases and saw the fraud that was there presented by the lawyers. She saw, for example, one doctor. They would parade them in little x-ray units that were portable, they would come out, and he'd read the x-ray, and they had all the diagnosis already filled out, and they would sign one doctor in 72 hours, diagnose silicosis in over 1,200 cases. Sounds suspicious to you? She threw the whole fraudulent thing out of the courts. We need more Judge Jacks who do their homework and have judicial courage and common sense. Okay, let's enter the court of the lawyers, counselors. You are agents of the court. You have a holy, sacred calling in this realm of exclusivity in which you operate, where we can't operate. Respect the law, fear the law, honor the law, protect the people. So I would say to lawyers, you're in that club, you're in that circle. It's a holy calling. Jesus speaks about scribes all the way through the scripture with great warnings. In that holy calling, you have to police some of this yourself. It's, we can't do it on the outside because we can't get inside. Now to the people, we have to be, well, we have to stop being so I'm going to sue you. I, we can sue anything about anybody, I think, almost any time. We just got to find somebody and some judge will do it. 
Man, and oh, yeah, well, and, and, and you, you've got a lot of junk science over getting legitimate science. And Judge Jack looked at legitimate science and saw the fraudulent part of this case, and she responded to legitimate science when the jurors can be swayed emotionally with junk science. So we, the people, have to drop back on all this litigation that we like to perpetuate. Well, we deserve that. It doesn't cost them anything. It's going to cost the insurance company. Let me tell you something. Ultimately, everybody will pay. Don't ever forget that. Where do we end up? Jesus would say to us, as he said to those in the scripture, justice, mercy, faithfulness. It was a rough ride on Wall Street here yesterday. The Dow briefly Congress quickly signed off on a new stimulus bill. The bill is passed. According to a new poll, only 23% of Americans trust the government. Five times more teens suffer from depression and anxiety. Unemployment rate topped 10% to a 26-year high. America is in crisis. This is the critical hour in our nation's history. In the series, Healing Broken America, Dr. Young uncovers the problems that face our nation and shows us where the healing of America must begin. Call toll free now, 1-800-494-9255 or visit us online at winningwalk.org to receive this important series for your gift of any amount. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. I want to extend to you a personal invitation to become a Winning Walk Pace Setter. Say, what is a Pace Setter? Pace Setters are faithful men and women who commit to regularly support the Winning Walk each month through their prayers, primarily, and through your financial gifts as God leads as God has enabled you. Now, let me tell you something. All the money given to the Winning Walk goes exclusively only to buy airtime to further the reach of the good news of Jesus Christ. Your regular monthly support makes it possible for the Winning Walk to continue proclaiming the proven truth of God's Word on television and radio and the Internet. To become a pace setter, Visit our website at winningwalk.org and check the donate button, or you can call the number on your screen right now. And let me in advance thank you for considering this. Remember, this goes only for broadcast time so we can better tell the world how Christ changes, heals lives.